absent a global recession, I think we're in a real sweet spot here. The commodities have outpaced the companies. The companies have maintained some sense of financial discipline, uh, but the companies are attractively priced, com in particular relative to the commodity price. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. The purchasing power of the world's major fiat currencies has taken a beating since the pandemic. Just in the US, due to the spike in inflation, Trueflation now estimates that the dollar has lost over a quarter of its purchasing power since January 2020. And due to this higher inflation, as well as continued expectations for higher secular inflation over the coming years, as globalization declines, nations reshore supply chains, and increasingly compete for global commodities, some of which are due for supply shortages, it's no surprise that more investors are looking increasingly towards owning hard assets as a hedge. So, what are the most important trends and opportunities in hard assets right now? To find out, we've got the good fortune to talk with Rick Rule, perhaps the most seasoned and respected natural resources investor alive today. Rick, it's wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Adam, it's a delight to be back with you. Thank you for having me back. Oh, you're always uh, such a wonderful, fun, and fascinating guest, Rick, uh, only surpassed by, by the times I get to spend with you in person when our paths cross in the real world. But thanks so much for coming back on. Our audience has been um, hammering me with requests to get you back on. So thank you for doing that. And a lot to dig into here. Um, maybe if we can just start, um, I'll, I'll, I'll begin with a tweak of the general question I like to ask at the beginning of these uh, discussions. What's going on in the world of hard assets right now? Um, many commodities have had a good year so far. You know, the precious metals have had a pretty good year. Cocoa has had a uh, uh, phenomenal year in many ways. Natural gas is picking back up. Um, are we indeed in a new bull market for hard assets? Uh, and if so, how long do you think it has to run? I think, in fact, we are in a bull market for resource assets. But I think what's happened up to now is just reversion to mean. <laughs> reversion Upwards to mean. Reversion. Reversion to mean is probably the most common uh, form of economic performance. And natural resources and precious metals underperform for a substantial period of time. So what we've seen now is reversion to mean. Uh, I, I believe that this is also prescient because I don't believe that we'll merely revert to mean, but as often happens, we'll go across the mean or the median line, uh, which is to say that we'll go higher than mean. Uh, and ultimately, I guess, perhaps after my passing, return again. <laughs> let's let's look at two different subjects within your question. One is precious metals. We can talk about why precious metals are doing well, but I think we can sum it up by saying precious metals do well when fear uh, around the continued purchasing power of fiat-denominated savings and investment assets uh, is growing. And I think that fear is growing. We can talk about why if you like, but I think it's enough to say right now that it is. The second is industrial materials, the stuff we need to maintain our material standard of living at the level to which we've become accustomed. A couple things are happening here. Uh, over the last 40 years, we've done a wonderful job of making 2 billion people on earth much less poor. Poor to be sure, but not starving any longer. Those people, Adam, want to live like you and I do, and increasingly they have the means to compete with us. Uh, at the same time, of course, there are more people every day. While that goes on, I would argue that for 30 years, we have underinvested in productive capacity around natural resources. If you don't make sustaining capital investments, your ability to produce falters at the same time that demand is growing. This is all very simple stuff. And that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, I do believe that we're coming into a bull market in natural resources. But I think the price performance that we've seen thus far is merely reversion to mean. Okay. And uh, that was actually very succinct. It was not long-winded at all. Um, and uh, I know predictions are tough, but let's sort of use the um, the baseball inning analogy. Um, if if this new bull market, you know, is a baseball game, this reversion of the mean has taken place over how many innings so far? Oh, I think we're about through reversion to mean. Uh, now, maybe I look back further than others. Uh, in other words, maybe at 71, what constant the 
what constitutes reversion to mean takes a longer period of time. But it's an example. If you look at the gold price over the last, say, two years, we have a, what, 20, 22% gain? Uh, I, I think what we've really seen there is reversion to mean. Similarly, with regard to the oil price, we had this unbelievable sell-off around COVID uh, to the point where oil was selling at a substantial discount to what it cost to produce, never mind the cost of capital. So we've had mm -hmm. reversion to mean there too. So if the question involves where are we in terms of reversion to mean, my suspicion is that we're there. In most commodities, most industrial commodities, commodity uh, prices uh, allow for uh, both the payment of social rent, which is to say tax and royalties, and also uh, the earning of the cost of capital, but no more. Uh, similarly, with regards to precious metals, uh, while gold isn't loved, uh, it is at the point where most people can at least spell it. Uh, so I would suggest that with regards to the baseball analogy, in terms of reversion to mean, we're there. In terms of the bull market, I think we're probably in the second inning. We're very, very, very early on. Okay. And I think I asked my question inelegantly. I meant more the latter. So, okay. So we're we're in the second inning and, and presumably that means uh, we have years to decades ahead of us in it. Uh, I'm too old to answer that question directly, uh, Adam. Uh, I don't know how long it has to go. Things seem to progress uh, more quickly these days than they used to. So I'm not prepared to um, put sort of time numbers on it. But perhaps we could talk in a very broad sense in dimensions. Uh, let me give you a couple of interesting facts. First of all, around precious metals. The market share of precious metals and precious metals-related assets in the U.S. market is less than one-half of 1%, which is to say that less than one-half of 1% 1 of all savings and investment assets in the United States <laughs> are uh, denominated in precious metals. That number is down from a four-decade mean of, four, of 2%, pardon me. If the market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets were to revert to mean, that's all, just to revert to mean, demand for the stuff would increase fourfold. And that's mm -hmm. precisely what I think is going to occur. J.P. Morgan Chase has been quoted as saying, although they don't have statistics to support it, that their estimate of the high point of the market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets was late 1981, uh, early 1982. And they suspected the market share at that point in time might have been between six and eight percent. I'm not suggesting to you, first of all, that number is right. Or secondly, if it is right, uh, that uh, the market share of those materials uh, would take out prior highs. I am suggesting that the market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets will revert to mean. Got it. Okay. Um, and, and sorry, just to go back to my question on timing for a minute, w wasn't trying to pin you down necessarily on a, on a time <clears throat> date, but more to give people a sense of this is not a trade that by the end of the year, it's over and you're out of it. This is something that's going to take a while and build steam for a good long while from here. You're nodding as I'm saying this. Adam, I'm I'm not even a trader. Uh, I, I answer a lot of questions on a lot of shows about the technical aspects of gold trading, like is 2410 some, you know, magical resistance or something <laughs> like that. Uh, the truth is I don't own gold because I think it might go from 2375 to 2538 or some number like that. I own gold because I'm afraid that it's going to 7000 or 8000 or $9,000. Mm -hmm. And the set of circumstances that would cause that price performance would damage other parts of my portfolio and my life. And when I say afraid, Adam, I am actually afraid. Uh, I live a very good life. And the set of circumstances that would occur in a $9,000 gold world would be distinctly unpleasant. What gold has done for me and lots of other people other, over time has, pro, it has been to provide purchasing power insurance mm -hmm. against the degradation that would occur in other parts of your portfolio if the circumstance uh, occurred 
that would allow that type of exponential increase in the gold price. That's why I own, I'm not a trader. I own gold for insurance. I own gold stocks because I'm fairly good at investing in them. Uh, and I'm an investor as well as a purchaser of insurance. Okay. Um, so uh, you would expect by the time this bull run is over, um, and I know we're going to be talking about the, the larger bull run and, and commodities in general, but we're starting here on precious metals. Um, you would expect a sign to you that we are getting near its terminus is that uh, you would expect us to be back up to um, at least the historic averages in terms of the role that precious metals plays in the world savings, which right now is at a paltry 0.5%, the four decade average, I think you said was 2%. My guess is you probably think we're going to overshoot it. It will go into overshoot at some point before this is over, but those will be the milestones you'll be looking for more at, right? Yeah, those are the numerical milestones. Let's talk about the fundamental milestones. Uh, when we don't engage in quantitative easing anymore, in other words, when the federal government doesn't counterfeit, uh, when I have some insurance that that's true, I'll care less about gold. Mm -hmm. When um, <laughs> when they balance the federal budget, did you realize? Maybe you're. Maybe you probably do. Your readers probably don't. The on balance sheet liabilities of our federal government, not state and local, just federal, exceed thirty four trillion dollars. And a scarier number than that, Adam, is that the off balance sheet liabilities, the net present value, not nominal value, the net present value uh, of entitlements, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, federal pensions, military pensions, exceeds a hundred trillion dollars. Now, we're trying to dig ourselves out of this debt trap with an on balance sheet budget deficit, unfunded on balance sheet budget deficit that grows by a trillion dollars every 100 days. So when I uh, have to worry less uh, about the unfunded and on balance uh, deficits, and when I understand how these future obligations, both to bondholders and to people expecting uh, entitlements, can be satisfied, I'll sell my gold. That's when I do it. Uh, when Congress begins to act rationally, when the American voters begin to act rationally, I bet if you walk down the, the street at whatever in whatever town that you live in and you asked random people on the street if they understood that the net present value of entitlements in this country was $100 trillion. By the way, that number comes from the Congressional Budget Office, not some cranky, bald old libertarian, uh, that they probably wouldn't even know what the nature of the statement meant. Mm -hmm. um, I got to tell you, <laughs> I'm nervous about that. And it's depressing how um, safe a bet on gold <laughs> that 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 seems to be. In other words, you know, to your point about yeah, when when Congress starts acting rationally, then you'll worry less, right? The odds of co Congress acting rationally and embracing fiscal discipline and putting us on a fiscally sustainable course, those odds just seem so vanishingly small right now. It, it, it is depressing. I would love to be right there with you, selling my gold along with you for those reasons, Rick. I, I don't suspect that's going to happen perhaps in your lifetime or mine. I hope so. I hope it does, but I'm not holding my breath. I had the uh, interesting uh, experience, not unpleasant, by the way, uh, of talking to a, a, a sitting uh, American congressman, I won't name whom, uh, and I was talking to this person about inflation and the inflation number that they cited believingly was the CPI, uh, 2.6%. This person said, well, while it needs to come down to 2, 2.6 isn't the end. Uh, I, I mean, it, it isn't as concerning as you make it out to be. And I, uh, I said, sir, you understand that the inflation number that you just cited is hedonistically adjusted, which means that the people who organize the statistic uh, are, are the people who measure the value of goods and services. It's not a market measurement. Did you recognize, too, that when it doesn't suit Congress, they don't include food or fuel? 
this is problematic to me because I eat. And then I said, finally, sir, did you understand that using this as a cost of living index is sort of odd because it doesn't include tax? For me personally, taxes are a larger constituent of my cost of living than shelter, food, energy, and transportation combined. The look on the congressman's face indicated to me that he wasn't a pernicious individual. He was an individual that had never considered the problem in the way that I presented it to him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and for that man, <laughs> you know, for that reason, I, I mean, people elected a person who conflates the cost of living with the CPI. Um, this is not good. <laughs> well, I mean, and we've talked about this before, Rick. I mean, this is a, a big reason why I founded Thoughtful Money, which is our, our education system does a terrible job of teaching financial literacy. Um, Congress um, has all of its uh, cor- corrosive and corruptive effects that it, it it enforces on whoever joins it. But you look at the average politician, even when they walk in the door, fresh faced, most of them have zero economic background, right? Um, so we have people who do not understand the ramifications of their decisions, making their decisions. Um, it's it's not a good system, uh, as, as, as you've said. Um, one one thing I've talked about, I won't go deep into it, but there was a um, an, an article that I of an interview of Neil Kashkari that I, I reacted pretty strongly to recently. Um, Neil Kashkari is is um, he's the head of the Minneapolis Fed, um, and he was recounting a discussion he had in Washington. He was talking to some, a couple of heads of, of organizations that represent workers. And um, and they basically told him, hey, you know, like this inflation's killing us. And, you know, if we could go back in time and had we been given a choice, we and our constituents would have totally taken the recession. We know how to deal with recessions. Yeah, some of us would have lost our jobs. That's happened to us in the past. We know that we'll get reabsorbed into the labor force as the economy picks back up. And we kind of know how to take care of each other and our families during those tough times. But we know it's it's something that's temporary and the economy will start growing again. And we, we kind of get that a recession is a needed part of the business cycle. But instead, you just lopped, you know, 25% of the purchasing power of our of our money, our wages off the table permanently. And Neil Kashkari could not believe that's, that that anybody would prefer a recession over the magnificence and 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 you know the glory of the Fed coming in and doing whatever it can to basically try to paper over the problem it created, but permanently damage people's financial prospects. It was like these people were telling Kashkari they'd rather you know live on Mars than than here in the U.S. Uh, and I think the function, uh, Adam, that you and thoughtful money fulfill is the fact that the political class and the people who vote for them uh, aren't going to protect you, uh, that you have to protect yourself. Exactly. The other side uh, of precious metals, if you will, uh, what you're trying to, trying to protect is the fact that you you buy an awful lot of insurance for a fairly small premium with precious metals. That's why I'm not concerned about a move from 2450 to 2550. Uh, I remember my first gold bull market where the price went from an admittedly price controlled $35 to $850. Uh, I remember a much more tame bull market, 2000 to 2011, where the gold price went from $256 to $1,900. The point of this is that you don't have to drink all the Kool-Aid. You don't have to put 100% of your portfolio in gold, and you shouldn't. Uh, a fairly small allocation to gold generates an awful lot of portfolio insurance with regards to the rest of your, you know, the re- the rest of your portfolio. If you are willing to do the extra work and take the extra risk on gold stocks, you can do better than that. But again, uh, what's important to note isn't merely the risk or the uh, risk avoidance, but also the potential reward uh, in circumstances where you think a bull market is upcoming but where the move that you've enjoyed is basically merely a reversion to mean. Okay. All right. So meaning the real action is ahead. So if we can, Rick, let's, let's dial through relatively briefly, 
the major categories of hard assets. And if you can just tell me, what are the trends in them that are most on your mind right now for each of these, these different sectors? And well, maybe let's 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 sure. round out the precious metals. You know, be, be beyond um, what's happened, right? Where we had crazy fiscal and monetary reaction to COVID. Um, going forward, what do you what do you look at as is what's most likely to drive what happens in that space? I, I think what's going to happen in the gold space is simply greater fear. People are going to look at the arithmetic around fiat denominated instruments, and they're going to be afraid. Uh, People are going to look at the probability that the Fed is going to have to lower interest rates in the face of persistently high inflation mm -hmm. and understand that the long bond is a lousy instrument. <laughs> if the interest rate goes up according to uh, markets, which is to say supply and demand of money, then the long bond absolutely gets crushed. If it doesn't, if the interest rate stays low, then what happens is the long bond gets crushed anyway because the purchasing power of the distribution <laughs> doesn't keep pace uh, yeah. or, or really truly lousy place to be. Um, if this continues, I think you'll see the gold stocks begin to bridge the gap uh, that has occurred. In other words, gold has outperformed the gold stocks so far. This is easy to understand. The purchasers of gold have been central banks and they don't buy gold stocks. You know, the idea that there was no follow through, people are scratching their heads over. This is a big no brainer. Uh, there was no retail participation in the gold market according to the statistics around the purchases and sales of ETFs until 11 weeks ago. Uh, now there is individual purchases of bullion in Western Europe and the United States. And traditionally, these people, in addition to being bullion buyers, have been gold stock buyers. So one would expect as the market for gold broadens and as the, as the momentum established by the metal itself continues, that that will eventually come down into the gold shares. I'm sorry, you look like you want to ask me a question. Well, yeah, just on that. So I've had a couple of people on the program relatively recently, um, Ronnie Stafferly from Incrementum. The in gold, he, he came on to reveal the latest uh, insights from his newest In Gold We Trust report. And we spent a fair amount of time talking about how um, the demand for gold was it, coming from central banks, but also on the retail side coming from the, West, the East, right? Mm -hmm. And that there was just no interest here in the West, right? And the question I asked him was, Okay, but M Wall Street loves momentum, and at some point, these um, these miners are gonna their margins are gonna really start popping, right? Um, because the price has gone up, and Wall Street, if it can make money, it will, and at some point, it's gonna realize that and, and shove money in there, and it, it just hasn't happened yet. Are are you saying we're beginning to see the signs that that Wall Street might be waking up? No, we aren't. Okay, um, Wall Street is reactive not anticipatory, I would argue, uh, having li lived on Wall Street a very long time myself. Uh, what you talk about is important, uh, but it's also important to note that even as the gold quote has gone up, the costs associated with producing gold have gone up too. So that the margin expansion that you're looking for has been tampered. Uh, it is estimated that the social cost of producing an ounce of gold, including uh, offsite capital expenditures by miners, uh, taxes and royalties have been increasing at 20% compounded. <laughs> Skilled labor has been increasing. Uh, uh, energy has been increasing. You are going uh, as early as this quarter to begin to see real margin expansion from the very high quality gold producers. Mm -hmm. But the rest of them haven't seen much margin expansion at all, simply because costs have risen as fast as the gold price, the gold quote has. As you see margin expansion, I think you will begin to see generalist investments coming into the gold, in, into the gold space. In fact, I think you'll see that anyway. Uh, I think you'll see an, incur, an increasing number of institutional investors, uh, particularly those that are responsible for long-term investments, endowments, pension funds, things like that, mm -hmm. go into the gold equities trade out of self-defense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it's it's going to be more of a show me the money trend, right? Where as the miners post the right. better margins, then the money yep. will come in. Remember this, uh, Adam, in terms of that history, in terms of the reticence with regards with re regards to how the investment community views the mining sector. Remember the poor, poor performance of the mining sector in the decade two thousand to two thousand ten. 
the market, the share prices did well in anticipation, but the operating performance was fictionally bad. Yeah. Terrible. The, uh, I mean, the gold quote increased sevenfold from 250 to 1900 and the free cash flow per share in the XAU declined. I mean, it took special skill to screw up an environment where the selling <laughs> price of your product went up sevenfold. So there is skepticism uh, around the ultimate corporate performance of the gold mining sector. Has the gold mining sector cleaned up its act at all since those bad days? It has, but it would be easy for them to be recidivist. Virtually all of the management teams that were responsible for the worst part of that performance were allowed to pursue other employment opportunities by the shareholders. Similarly, uh, the investors who now own gold mining shares, myself included, uh, keep their managers on a much tighter leash than we used to. Mm -hmm. Now, if the gold price increases and the gold share prices go up, uh, then investor tolerance may return. And certainly if investor tolerance returns, uh, management misfeasance uh, <laughs> and malfeasance uh, will be something that we have to contend with in the future. But I don't see that circumstance uh, getting on our way for two or three years. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like you think that we are kind of poised for a nice heyday in the mining shares um, uh, as they begin to demonstrate higher profitability. Absent a global recession, I think we're in a real sweet spot here. The commodities have outpaced the companies. The companies have maintained some sense of financial discipline, uh, but the companies are attractively priced, com in particular, relative to the commodity price. Awesome. Okay. Uh, last question on precious metals before we move off. Uh, we've talked about gold. We've talked about the miners. Anything notable to say about silver before we move on? My experience has been that Precious metals bull markets are kicked off by gold, by the fear buyer. Uh, when the momentum is established, particularly when the momentum becomes uh, palatable to generalist investors, uh, that is to say the greed buyer, <laughs> uh, silver, perhaps of its higher volatility, perhaps of its lower unit cost, uh, takes over leadership. It moves further. It moves faster. We have seen uh, a real move in the junior silver equities uh, in the last six months, which suggests that silver might be, or, or the investors might be anticipating that move. Again, I think you have reversion to mean. Uh, a selection of the higher quality silver, uh, silver juniors six or seven months ago literally could not get a bid. <laughs> and maybe what you've seen in terms of the share price escalation is just that we've worn out the sellers rather than we've established buyers. But a silver bull market, a silver equities bull market is truly, truly something to behold. I'm hoping to enjoy one more in my life. I remember well the decade of the 1970s when just one little stock, Coeur d'Alene Silver, which sadly I didn't own, went from 10 cents to $65. My goodness. If you move forward to the early 1990s bull market, a short bull market, uh, two that I did own, uh, Pan American Silver went from fifty cents to forty dollars in six years. Silver Standard went from seventy-two cents to over forty dollars in six years. People don't understand the magnitude of these precious metals equities markets. Now, I'm not suggesting that people crowd into any every silver penny dreadful on the planet. Uh, people need to understand something about what makes a silver equity work. But a silver equities bull market is a truly wonderful and strange beast. Okay. Um, so many following questions I'd love to ask. Um, I'm not going to, one, for the interest of time, but also because in a little bit, we're going to talk about uh, a, a, an opportunity where folks that want to ask those questions will get the best opportunity to do so. Um, all right. So let's move on quick to energy. Um, again, looking looking ahead next year plus, what are the trends that you think are most in the driver's seat? Well, uh, energy, again, I think is a no-brainer, depending on how you define energy. You know, the big thinkers in the world have told you that the end of fossil fuel uh, is with us. That noted energy physicist Greta Thornburg is an example. <laughs> President Biden, Prime Minister Trudeau, these guys. Uh, the thing is, it isn't. Let's again examine a few facts. Uh, alternative energy, of course, is going to be the, the end of fossil fuels, they say. <clears throat> we have now spent over the last 40 years well in excess of $5 trillion 
And we have reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 82% 40 years ago all the way down to 81% today. A $5 trillion investment has reduced the market share of fossil fuels from 82% to 81%. What makes you think with any investment in any amount of money that we will uh, enjoy, if that's the right phrase, peak oil demand in 2030. This is an absolute absurdity. Another number, the oil industry on a global basis, including prominently state-owned oil companies, is uh, under-investing in sustaining capital investments to the tune of a billion US dollars per day. In a capital-intensive business like oil and gas, if you don't invest in sustaining capital, you reduce your ability to, pr to produce. In other words, you encourage supply shortages. Supply shortages support price. The rational response to that is to look for profitable companies with good uh, um, project pipelines that are making the sustaining capital investments so that they will be able to produce into upcoming supply shortages. Uh, this is so simple. Uh, you, you have an industry that's enjoying absolute record free cash flow. You have them competing with some brain dead morons, both public and private, who don't understand that the outlook for fossil fuels is still very bright. And you can easily segregate the companies that are making sustaining capital investments from those who don't. Uh, investing in this theme for the five-year time frame is as close to a no-brainer as you can get. And by the way, you don't have to wait five years to be right. These companies are paying wonderful dividends and buying back stock while you wait. All right. Um, so, of course, the next question is, is, well, what are those companies, Rick? And again, I'm going to punt for our discussion a little bit later on in the discussion to let folks know where they can go hear them. Great. Um, all right. So... Um, and I'm, I'm trying to get to another the reason I'm speaking quickly is I'm trying to get to another question after this. Um, so maybe industrial metals and the soft uh, agricultural commodities, anything notable to say about those other two? The soft agricultural commodities are very, very difficult to forecast uh, because, uh, of course, with annual crops, you can impact supply and demand year by year by year. Uh, high wheat prices are greeted by pillar to post plantings. <laughs> and price collapses in the out years. I, I've tried to predict those things for 40 years. My track record's unblemished by success. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that. All right. It's safe to say that farmland, which you have been a fan of, but I think you've said in recent years has become richly valued. Is it still in a richly valued category? Yeah, it's it's becoming more attractive again, simply because the rate of growth has leveled off while inflation has not leveled off. But the truth is, you know, six or seven years ago, we saw basically, you know, a, a, an astonishing increase in the price of very, very high quality farmland. It will always be a wonderful localized business. You know, if you live in an area with a lot of farmland, you know, a lot of families and there's a third generation farming family selling a farm or selling a part, a part of a farm that isn't core to them. It's a wonderful business. For you and I as passive investors, um, there are easier ways to make money. Okay. All right. And then on the industrial side of things, uh, anything you might want to say? I do know that, that copper, there's a lot of renewed interest in copper right now. There's a lot of good things happening in the industrial materials business. Copper is priced well enough that you're going to maintain current production. You're not shutting in mines. But it isn't priced well enough to incent very many new mines. Meanwhile, there's political risk to copper production around the world, highlighted by Panama stealing the Cobre Panama mine, 3% uh, of world's copper supply. Probably of more interest to me uh, are materials like nickel, uh, which has fallen by 50% in price. You'll recall from earlier discussions that we've had that the cure for low prices is always low prices. Mm -hmm. And they're shutting in primary nickel production around the world, which will have an impact two years from now or three years from now. My favorite industrial material subject, because it's so educational, is lithium. You know that lithium went on an absolute tear uh, as demand for lithium, for lithium-ion batteries, among other uses, soared. 
uh, we were never short of elemental lithium. We were short of the refining capacity to turn it into something useful. Mm -hmm. Lithium quote up went sixfold. We went around the world looking for lithium. We'd never looked for it before. It isn't hard to find. We found tons. Meanwhile, uh, the industry was debottlenecking productive capacity. So now the lithium quote is off by 75% with lots more coming on the market. My suspicion is that for two years from now, maybe, lithium will be regarded by investors as a four-letter word, okay. the same way they regarded uranium. And when that happens, there's going to be wonderful opportunities. You're going to be able to pick up lithium deposits that cost, you know, 300 or 400 million dollars to discover and put in production. You'll be able to pick up these things with 30 with 30 or 40 million dollar market caps because people are going to hate lithium. That's the way the industrial materials market works. When a commodity is in severe enough oversupply that it is selling at a discount to the cost of production, the stage is being set for a dramatic rebound. Well, and that's that's why investors like you uh, can can be so successful with the right approach here. Is it, is it gives you a lot of boom bust opportunities that if you can be patient and smart, um, and identify the right targets and and get your timing semi decent, you can you can really buy real value, real deep value. Um, because you mentioned it, and then we'll move on. Um, but I have to ask it because you mentioned it, uranium, and, and and maybe maybe my my short question there is just. Maybe back to the baseball analogy. Where are we in the uranium story? Uh, I think now we're in later innings, six or seven. Okay. I think the easy money has been made. Uh, the move in uranium from twenty dollars a pound to eighty or ninety dollars a pound uh, was the easy money, and, and uranium went from being really thoroughly hated to being of interest to people. Well, the easy money has been made. Uh, I've now sold enough of my uranium stocks that I have no net investment in my uh, remaining uranium stocks. Wow. What's important okay. to do, and we don't have time to cover it, is because of the changing structure of the uranium market, because uh, the market is progressing from a spot market to a term market, the sure money is ahead of us. In uranium, unlike any other commodity that I know of on the planet, producers and consumers can enter into contracts with specify prices and terms in the 15 or 20 year time frame, mm -hmm. which means that you take the guesswork out of the commodity price and you take a lot of the guesswork out of the margin. This doesn't occur in any other commodity. So the ability to value a, a pre-production stage project with certainty uh, exists in uranium where it doesn't exist anywhere else. This has absolutely fascinating uh, implications, which we could talk about sometime in the future if we had time. Okay. Yep. Um, and we don't now, but we will your market. Um, maybe get you on to do just a just a uranium deep dive. Uh, I know you've done some boot camps on that um, with your company in the past. All right. So here's a question I was trying to get to because I thought this would be a little fun. Um, we'll, we'll do it relatively rapid fire. But um, how much of a game changer would the following be? Do you think in terms of its ripple effect on the the global commodities? market. I'm going to go through a couple of them, but I'll just I'll mention one and then let you talk about it and I'll go on to the next. First is peace in Ukraine. What would you expect the knock-on effects of that to be? Uh, I think in the near term, uh, surprisingly small. I think one knock-on effect may be the price of land and liquefied natural gas from the US into Europe uh, with the anticipation of the return of Russian gas. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the underlying problems that we face, both regards to supply and also to the fiscal cliff, wouldn't go away. Uh, there might be a, a downdraft in the gold price because people mistake, mistakenly believe that concern around geopolitics is, re is responsible uh, for the strength in gold. Mm -hmm. My suspicion is that the budget pressures in the United States even after peace in the Ukraine, uh, would still be extraordinary. I think Congress would find something else to waste the money on. Got it. Okay. A um, couple quick questions on this super quick. One is just, I just, I don't know. Um, how much, you know, we remember the sabotaging of the Nord Stream gas pipeline from Russia. How much infrastructure is in place today to turn gas back on uh, 
or at least the, the gas volumes that they were used to pre-war back on uh, between Russia and Europe? I think it'll be a real challenge, not just because of the destruction of the Nord Stream gas pipeline, but also because if passed as prologue, when the Russians need money, <laughs> they clearly need money now, like they did in 1990 and 1991, they defer sustaining capital investments. So my suspicion, if 1990, 1991, 1992 are any indication, uh, the Russians are not reinvesting sufficiently in maintaining production and transmission capacity within Russia. Got and it. that'll be a challenge. It'll take two or three years to cure that. It, it'd take a while. Okay. And and you didn't really mention the oil price reacting. Would you imagine the oil price would soften if, if there was expectation that Russian oil would start free, more freely flowing again? I think it might it, it might soften up in the futures market, but the truth is the sanctions haven't worked. Right. It's already uh, out there just through different yeah. channels. I mean, the United States isn't buying Russian oil. The Indians are buying Russian oil. So the oil that was, diver that was uh, going to India that's been diverted by Russian oil is now coming into the United States. <laughs> Oil's very fungible. This is all political theater. Okay. All right. Um, last question on Russia, um, just because I get asked it still with a surprising degree of frequency. If somebody held an ADR in a Russian company, do they have any hope of those things having value in the future or are they, are they just gone? Well, you're talking to somebody who owns five of them. Uh, there are ways that you can take if you want to, uh, to get yourself out of the problem. I have a bank in front of the U.S. government for organizations, so I'm not involved in <laughs> any of that. Uh, the Russians would frankly welcome you if you wanted to surrender your ADR uh, for ordinary shares, which trade in Russia. You can, as an American, open an account with Sabir Bank uh, or uh, other entities and trade in Russia. As I say, I have elected as somebody who has a bank and organization in front of the U.S. government not to engage in that type right. of activity, but it's out there to do. Uh, my suspicion is that ultimately we find some form of rapprochement with Russia. And I hope then that my ADRs will have value. Okay. So these, these, in your opinion, and this is not a guarantee or anything like that, is they're, they're not 100% dead. Um, they, they could be reanimated, maybe. Correct. Okay. All right. So folks, if you've been asking me, that's the, the best I have right now on that. Um, all right. So next potential game changer. Um, things escalate, escalate, sorry, escalate dramatically in the Middle East. Knock on effects of that, do you think? Uh, you know, the Middle East is an important source of global energy among anything else. And uh, somebody chucking a missile in the Straits of Hormuz, shutting down the Straits of Hormuz from either side, which is to say the Shiites blowing up a Sunni tanker, the Sunnis blowing up a Shiite a Shia tanker would have a dramatic impact. Okay. Because they already chuck it, they're chucking some drones around. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course the Houthis are, you know, trying to be problematic in the Red Sea. Um, a bunch of the Saudi crude now crosses Saudi Arabia uh, and is in fact loaded in the Red Sea. So they've taken some steps to loosen their dependency on the Straits of Hormuz. But if things really, really, really went wrong in the Middle East, all bets would be off in the conventional energy market. Okay. And so oil, what, $200 plus oil type of deal? Uh, pick a number. What number would cause you to stop driving? Um, okay. There's a lot of short-term um, demand inelasticity with regards to price in energy because it's so critical to what we do. Okay, I got two more of these, and then we'll then we'll get to our important point, and then we'll wrap up. Um, China invading Taiwan. I'm not sure what impact that would have. Um, to be honest with you, I'd I'd rather not venture a guess. I'm not sure how it would impact the import market for raw materials into China. I just don't know. Okay. Um, and then the last one is uh, just what do you think will be the most notable um, impact on the markets we're talking about, the, the commodity markets we're talking about, given the two different potential outcomes for the U.S. presidential election in October? 
I suspect that were Trump to prevail, uh, that equity markets would be stronger. Uh, oil markets, or at least the market for oil shares, would be much smart, uh, much stronger, given the electorate's belief that he's pro energy. Um, you know, from my own viewpoint, without belaboring it, uh, I personally wouldn't vote for either of them. Uh, but that's a, a, a very different statement. Um, right. But sadly, they won't affect the outcome. Right now, as best we know, one of them is going to be in the seat. Yeah, one, one of them sadly has to win. Uh, my suspicion is if Mr. Trump won in the short term, it would be good for the economy and it would be good for energy stocks and perhaps resource stocks in the sense that he seems to be at least, least ho less hostile uh, to energy and resource development in the United States. Okay. Yep. So, from from a expected reduction in regulation and maybe right. additional support for the the sectors. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for going through that exercise. But I know lots of people have been thinking about all of those things and, and the impact it might have if they're commodity investors. Um, all right. So this is the the time during these interviews, Rick, where I unfairly pressure you to start sharing individual, uh, you know. The individual stocks that are on your watch list in each of these sectors. And, and you always very generously let me do that. And you walk through um, you know specific tickers that folks should go look at and you give the reasons why. And I'm not going to do that this time around because there's a much better venue for people to get that information out of you at, at a lot more detail as well. So you have one of your, um, your organization does boot camps and conferences uh, from time to time. But but every year in July, you guys do a really big symposium. And that's coming up next month. Um, so tell folks about that. What, what, what can they expect at that symposium? Well, we do two things of use, actually. Uh, any of your listeners who want for free can go to my website, ruralinvestmentmedia.com, and list your natural resource stocks. For no obligation, no charge, I'll personally rank them, one to 10. And I'll add comments if I think my comments have any value around individual issues. But what we do that's much more useful is we teach. Uh, the Rural Natural Resources Investment Symposium is now, I'm told, in its 28th year. I don't remember that far back, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll assume. I like that they have to tell you, even though I'll, you've, you're the only I'll, one that's been there. I'll assume right that's here. correct. So first of all, Adam, we've stood the test of time. Um, we have successfully catered to an audience for a long time that keeps coming back. Why do they keep coming back? Well, part of it is just the audience, a very, very, very high quality group of people. And you can learn from high quality people, even if they're not paid to speak, but we do pay people to speak. The first thing that we do is we offer just absolutely superb, uh, big picture macroeconomic stuff, not the stuff that CNBC or CBC wants you to believe. Uh, but rather information about the way the world is. Jim Rickards, if you want to be scared, somebody who talks to you about the structure of financial services as the former chief counsel of long-term capital management who almost brought down the financial structure <laughs> in and of themselves. We talked about the Fed earlier. Uh, Daniela DiMartino Booth talking about the Fed from the belly of the beast because she was in the Fed. Nomi Prinz talking about the structure of Wall Street because she was a partner at Goldman Sachs. Yep. People who talk to you about the way it really is because they were really there. That's really important. If you come to understand that worldview and its impact on natural resources, we have wonderful analysts and portfolio managers who have made money where the rubber meets the road in resources for three or four decades. Not some failed investment banking flunky, who couldn't do technology and couldn't do marijuana stocks and has been parachuted down to gold where he or she can't do any harm, but folks who have actually existed in this, in this market profitably for a very long time. Importantly, Adam, my favorite feature is the living legends. We have a group of entrepreneurs who have built multi-billion dollar mining companies from scratch. Uh, they tell you about the lessons that they learned. They tell you about how it made them better investments. 
investors, pardon me, they tell you how to spot the $5 million market cap that's going to become a $5 billion market cap. And these are important lessons to learn because these are guys who have lived it. And when I get them on stage, by the way, I say, listen, give me the name of three companies that you own that you don't run. Do the process for me. They don't always <laughs> answer, but you know, a guy's got to ask, right? Another thing about our conference that I really like is that every public company exhibitor there has been vetted by us. At every other investment conference I know, the qualification to be an exhibitor is a check that cashes. Uh, at our conference, those shares have to be owned in accounts, owned and managed by ourselves. Now, there's unfortunately no guarantee that because I, go, I own a stock, it goes up. But there is a guarantee that the process is honest <laughs> because we've invested in them. And because of all those things, whether or not you attend live in Boca Raton, July 7 to 11, or in the comfort and convenience of your own home, via live stream, the tapes of the conference, the conference recordings will be available to you for the balance of the year. And also, if you don't think that you got your money's worth, your choice, not mine, email me. I'll give you your money back. There's a no questions asked gold-plated money guarantee. If you don't think that the value that we offered up to you as an attendee, either live or via live stream, is worth the tuition that you paid, just email me. We'll give you your money back. The financial risk is all ours. No other investment conference that I'm aware of on the planet has this gold-plated money back guarantee. Well, how can you argue with that, Rick? Um, all right. Well, look. Um... A couple of things. Uh, first off, folks, uh, I, this is a great opportunity. I'm a huge, huge proponent uh, and fan of, of Rick in general, but this event specifically. Rick did ask me to go participate very kindly. I, I'm sure I was the uh, least uh, uh, impressive of, of the folks that he's invited there. And, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to be there only because the timing Folks may remember my father passed away right before Christmas, so I'm going to be back home with my family for his service that literally that same window. Otherwise, I would be there. Um, but Rick, so for folks that um, want to learn more about the conference, sign up for it. Um, I know there's a, a link that your team provided me with. It's kind of a long link. So um, I've just set up a redirect. So folks, if you're interested, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com slash rule, R-U-L-E, and it'll link directly to all the information about the conference. Folks can learn about it there, register for it there. And um, I'm going to bet, Rick, while it's a, probably a big carrot for folks, I'll bet you're going to get zero uh, requests for, for refunds because I know from previous experience uh, that uh, it is an incredible value for the price. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm certain of that. Uh, as I recall, we had two requests for refunds last year. Both of them said that uh, the material was above their head. In other words, we gave them more than they could absorb. You gave them too much, yeah. Well, well I'm not sure that was my fault. Uh, absolute money back guarantee. Well, and, and on that, you know, I so I've, I've, I've seen material from past events, um, just in case folks are worried that, oh my gosh, are they, are they speaking in industry wonk, you know, speak, and I'm not gonna be able to follow anything. It's not like that. It really isn't. Now, if you are an industry wonk and want to dive deep, there are for right. sure people there you can uh, have those conversations with. And in that panel you talked about, the living legends, um, that is an incredible gift for somebody who is an active investor in this space because, you know, as someone who's been investing in this space for a long time, it is a continuous learning journey. And if you are not a geologist, if you're not somebody who goes out and visits these mines like you did in your career, Rick, but I haven't done, um, there's a lot of guesswork that goes in there and you learn a lot of lessons the hard way, right? And being able to talk to these guys who have built these companies and invest in them over the decades is a phenomenal way to stand on their shoulders and you know, be told, hey, here's a lot of common pitfalls to avoid that you would probably fall victim to if you weren't getting these shortcuts from these, these great minds. Adam, I'll give you a wonderful anecdote. About five years ago, I got an email from an attendee saying the ability to follow Robert Friedland, for your attendees who don't know who Robert Friedland is, he's built several multi-billion dollar companies. He said the ability to follow Robert Friedland around the exhibit hall and see which exhibits he stopped in front of mm -hmm. and occasionally listen to the questions he asked them 
was worth the price of admission. They said, I got the whole rest of the conference for free. <laughs> I think it's a very valid way to look at it. All right. Well, look, one other thing I want to make, uh, I want to put out there to, to you viewers. So something else that Rick has mentioned um, in previous appearances um, in his interviews with me is the fact that he is involved in um, launching a new bank uh, called Battle Bank. And Rick, I'll let you give folks the 30 seconds on that, however you want. But more than several times now when the camera has finished, you know, you and I, Rick, have, have said, oh, you know, we should probably do a video just on the banking system and because um, you're very knowledgeable about it, but also so you can tell folks what Battle Bank's all about and interested folks can reach out to you about that. And um, we just get busy with other stuff. So folks, um, I'm going to let Rick talk about Battle Bank in just a second. But after he does, if you would like for us to do a special video with Rick on the future of the banking system and you know, getting a detailed um, understanding of why Battle Bank's created and the advantages that it offers, let me know in the comments section below. And if there's enough interest, we'll definitely do that. So Rick, real quickly, for folks that might not be aware of it, what is Battle Bank all about? Adam, I'm an old, bald, fat, rich guy, a wonderful bank bank customer. You're in good my shape. Relation, you my in relationship good. with my existing banks sucks, and banking sucks. And the uh, knowledge that American financial consumers have about banking is terrible. I mean, truly terrible. Uh, we built a prior bank called EverBank from a standing start, one of the nation's first internet banks with a fairly simple premise uh, that we wouldn't have a whole bunch of confusing products. We had one high-yield money market account. It pays you an interest on your savings, including your checking, not 16 products, six of which pay you no interest, like the big banks. We decided that some people would want to save in currencies outside the U.S. dollar. So we had certificates of deposit available in 22 currencies. We didn't have branches. Uh, if you weren't competent enough that this could be our branch, uh, we thought you should go to a dumb person's bank. Uh, and because we didn't have branches, we saved 125 or 150 basis points in non-interest expense, which we could pass on to our depositors and borrowers. We sold that bank in 2014 to uh, TIAA. Uh, and... For various reasons, uh, including the fact that TIAA is organized to serve retired teachers who are not our target market, uh, they sort of abandoned the 275,000 depositors who were our market. Mm -hmm. So we're starting again. What are we going to do? A lot of the same things. No branches, a very few products, but very high quality. We're going to pay you money on your checking account. Did you know, Adam? It's estimated that there's $2 trillion in the U.S. in savings products that aren't getting paid interest. I mean, you think the Fed is a threat. Is a, is a threat. Think about uh, investor inertia. Yeah. Ha having seen how little my <laughs> big commercial bank paid me in interest over the past five years, I believe it. It's astonishing. We think that people would like to save in, in currencies outside the U.S. dollar. In our last bank, that was an $8 billion deposit product. So obviously, we'll have it back. Adam, we believe that your IRA is your IRA. Most banks believe that your IRA is a receptacle for their mutual funds and annuities. In our IRA, you can own a duplex. You can own a triplex. You can buy a franchise. You can invest in private equity. Your IRA is, in fact, your IRA. And by the way, if you buy a duplex or a triplex, we'd like to talk to you about writing the first mortgage for you. <laughs> Further, most of our competitor banks don't think that gold is good security. I think gold is wonderful security. No other bank that I'm aware of will make margin loans on gold and silver held in segregated accounts. We will. Uh, if you're uncomfortable with your current bank for any reason, particularly if they're not paying you interest, <laughs> By all means, check out Battle Bank. I would love to have a discussion with you, Adam, about Battle Bank, but I'd like to expand the discussion just to talk about banking. This is now my seventh bank. Uh, I have been a borrower. I have been a depositor. I have been a shareholder. I have all kinds of relationships with banks. I'm fascinated by banks. I'm disgusted with the banking system. And frankly, I'm disgusted with America's depositors uh, for not paying more attention to their own money. 
All right. Um, well, look, I could uh, I could dig into you in great detail with that, Rick, but let's save that for the special video if indeed folks want to hear it. I think they're going to. But again, folks, if you want to have Rick go deep on both the banking system and Battle Bank, let us know in the uh, in the comments below. Um, we'll, we'll try to do that live too, so that folks can ask you, Rick, after great. the main part of the discussion, they can ask you their own questions and you can you can field those. Um, all right. Well, look, in wrapping up here, a um, couple quick things, folks. Um, so first off, if you've enjoyed this discussion with Rick, would like to see him come back on the program for any reason, whether it's one of the ones we mentioned or, or something else he sees in the horizon and wants to come back and let us know about, please let him know that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. A reminder, we are now getting quite close to the uh, 100,000 subscriber milestone on this YouTube channel. Um, so exciting to be doing that within our first six months. Um, it's uh, when we hit it, it'll be very helpful for us, not just because we get a fancy plaque from YouTube, but because uh, the, the um, YouTube algorithm will take this channel more seriously. So it really does help us if you can click that subscribe note. Uh, also, if you want to take anything that Rick mentioned here about uh, the hard assets market uh, and potentially integrate that into your portfolio, unless you're already a, a successful and experienced hard assets investor yourself, highly recommend that you do so under the guidance of a good financial advisor who is well experienced in uh, investing in hard assets, a lot of them aren't, um, who also takes into account all the macro issues that Rick mentioned here. And to be honest, when you put all those requirements on top of themselves, the, the playing field gets pretty narrow of financial advisors who are good at all that. But if you've got one, great, work with them. If you don't, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the ones uh, who you see on this channel with me every week um, because they do fit uh, that requirement set. To do that, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com. Fill out the short form there. Only takes you a couple seconds. Uh, these firms will be out, uh, whoever you get matched with will be out to reach out to you within 24 hours to schedule the consultation. They're totally free. There's no commitment. It's just a free public service they offer. All right, um, Rick, I can't thank you enough. I've got one last question for you if you can. You are a hugely successful individual across your career, um, both in terms of the companies that you've built, as well as uh, being an investor, as well as impacting the lives of many people around the world through your public speaking, but also a lot through your philanthropic stuff, which you don't really talk much about publicly, but I know uh, a bit from talking to you privately, super impressive. What's, what's an important lesson you learned along the way that you think is worth sharing with the audience here? Gratefulness, I think, is one, uh, and, and thoughtfulness. Uh, all of us run into tragedies. You've had one recently. I've had some. Uh, but you need to put all those things in balance. Uh, with regards to my uh, material success, I, I need to tell you, Adam, uh, when I stopped worrying about making money and I started worrying about generating utility for others, when mm -hmm. I focused on what I wanted to do and where I could add the most value, within a quarter, I started making more money. Don't worry so much about making money. Worry about adding value. You add value best in uh, subjects where there's a need, uh, but that you're fascinated in. It was impossible early in my career for my competitors to outcompete me because they were thinking about buying a Lamborghini or buying a house. Uh, and I was following my passion and serving my markets. So I would suggest that uh, gratefulness and thoughtfulness are important uh, in terms of life in general. But in terms of material success, understand that material success comes from serving others and saving the difference in utility between the utility that you generated and the utility that you consume. Incredibly valuable words of wisdom. Thanks so much, Rick. As always, this has been wonderful. Really appreciate you coming back on. Thanks so much for giving so much of yourself here. Look forward to having you back on the channel again whenever you've got time. But in the interim, good luck with the symposium next month. I know it's going to be great. Uh, I thank you for your efforts, and I look forward to seeing you live and in person at the 2025 in Natural Resources Investment Symposium. I, it's a deal. I will absolutely be there, my friend. Thanks so much. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.